like to welcome everyone to worship this morning. Our opening hymn is number 466, Praise the Lord with the Sound of Trumpet. Let's uh, worship God. And again, a, a warm welcome to everyone as we gather for worship today on this first, first sort of, I always feel like this is the first official Sunday of, of church as we start up again in the fall. If you're visiting our congregation, uh, we hope you feel welcome and will join us downstairs in Rodney Hall following the service. It's directly below our sanctuary. If, you, if you're able, fill out one of the welcome cards that are printed beside your hymn book uh, to mark your visit with us. And if you'd like to have a visit or you'd like us to contact you uh, about uh, any more information about Knox, uh, we'll be happy to do that. Lots of announcements in the bulletin. Uh, today is Grandparents' Day, and, and many of you received a carnation from one of our children uh, on the way into our sanctuary today. It's a day when we really are thinking about uh, relationships, about the people who are uh, grandparents to us and also the people who are like grandparents to us. Uh, following the service, we'll be having a cake in Rodney Hall, so we hope uh, you'll all join us. An announcement that didn't make it in the bulletin, the Bible study group starts up again this coming Wednesday. That's Wednesday at 10.30 in the library. And if you're interested in uh, coming to the Bible study, you're welcome to come. Use the Mitchell Street entrance and it's just to your left as you walk in the door. That's this Wednesday. 
On Friday, we're having a $5 Family Friday, and we started these last year. Uh, $5 Family Fridays are an opportunity for families, either parents and kids or grandparents or, and kids, uh, to come together uh, for a family meal. And it costs $5 for a family. There is no programming. You just come in, we say a quick grace, you eat with your family, and we're trying hard to have a meal that's really delicious and kid-friendly and has at least a little bit of healthy components to it. <laughs> so some fruit or some vegetables. And uh, it's open to everyone. So if you're free on Friday night and you want a low-cost meal with no dishes, uh, join us on Friday and again use the Mitchell Street entrance. Uh, I was just singing the praises of how it's, you know, we're trying to make it healthy. But we are looking for a donation of brownies for Friday night. <laughs> Because it's also got to have some sweets. So if you're uh, a baker and you're able to donate brownies, if you could speak to Megan or Allison today, and uh, they'll just make a note of that, and you can drop it off uh, Thursday or Friday during the day. Uh, other announcements. We're looking for some volunteers coming up. Uh, we're looking for volunteers for our Welcome to St. Thomas event which is being held the first, uh, the first Sunday afternoon in October. And uh, there's lots of things we're doing with that event, but one is we're trying to make sure that people who are new to our city uh, get connected, both with church, but also with wider community events. And we held this last year, had a great turnout. So we're looking for help um, both on the day of the event and also to do some flyer delivery and put some posters up. And so if you're able to help with that, if you could see Dan Russell. And Dan, do you want to wave so everybody knows who you are? That's Dan. And you can talk to Dan after church today. Uh, the Euchre and Bridge Night is getting uh, planned for the end of October. And they're also looking for some muscle, some volunteers to set up and take down chairs for that event. And so if you're able uh, to help with that, you can see Sharon Pinelo. And Sharon's going to wave. She's over on this side. So those are the, if you're able to help in either of those ways, please see those people. But a few people uh, talk about church membership, and so we'll be holding a new members class uh, coming up. Uh, if you're interested in membership, uh, if you could let the office know uh, sometime in the next week or two, uh, and we'll be having people join in the fall. We're also hoping to have a, a youth class for kids or young adults who are, are interested in joining the church. And I'm thinking we'll probably wait till the winter months to do that, but I'm looking for some feedback on what timing is better for our young people. Uh, you'll notice the colored insert in your bulletin. Our kitchen witches are selling uh, Thanksgiving pies, and so I draw your attention to that announcement, and you have a week or two to, to fill in your form and, uh, and order your pies for Thanksgiving. Finally, the sympathy of our congregation goes to Marg Rieger today, and I don't think Marg is here. Oh, she is here today, and Marg lost her brother. Uh, just this week. And so uh, we think about her and we pray for her family. On this Grandparents Sunday, we are reminded that church is not something to take for granted. Church is a gift. It is one of the very few places in our society where generations still mix. Where else can you find a toddler lifting her voice in song alongside a teenager and alongside a busy parent or a middle-aged businessman or a single retired person or a group of women in their mid-80s or mid-90s? Where else but the church? This is Christ's family. And it is Christ who welcomes each of us here, young and old and in between. And we are invited to recognize that God is in our midst. Let's worship God together today. Let's join together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, you know us each by name. And so we pray that you will hear our prayers today, prayers for ourselves, 
and prayers for people we love. Prayers for our church and our families. Prayers for our city and our world. Holy God, give each of us the grace today to be still in this sacred place and for this sacred hour. Give us the humility to see ourselves through your eyes. And give us the wisdom to listen and to open our hearts and our lives to you. Living God, be at work among us this morning so that this church might be a place where your spirit settles. For we bring this prayer to you in the name of Christ who taught us when we pray together to also say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our responsive reading this morning is a litany for Grandparents' Day, and uh, our reader is Lucas Abdi and his grandmother, Jeanette Heil. And we need to thank Lucas and, and his grandma. They ex were asked to do this last minute, and uh, Lucas is one of those guys I can always count on to say yes. So thank you, Lucas. I have to say that. He said grandma's nervous, but not Lucas. <laughs> okay. Not me over that. We worship the God of Abraham and Sarah. Our grandpa our grandfather and grandmother in the faith. We worship the God of all generations. We offer God our gratitude today for the gift of grandparents. We offer God our gratitude today for the gift of people who have been like grandparents to us. We thank God for the wisdom and guidance of all those who have traveled life before us. We thank God for the gift of grandchildren and for the gift of we thank God for the unique joy, wonder, and energy of the youngest among us. The Spirit of God calls us to encourage one another and to love one another. May, May the Spirit be work in our families, in our church, and in our world. Amen. Awesome job. Our baptismal hymn is number 515, and uh, we'll sing all of the verses, and then we'll repeat verse 1 after the children's time and the sacrament of baptism. Let's sing together number 515. <laughs>
seated. Now I'll tell you, these are the kinds of secrets a clergy person should never confess, but often I'd like to say that the children's time is often planned months in advance. But most of you know me well enough to know that's probably not true. Lots of times I'm driving on my way to church and I'm thinking, wonder what I should do for the children's time today. And I had a great idea. And so I was all ready and I walked in the door and then I received a gift downstairs in my office. And then I came upstairs to the sanctuary and I received a second gift. And it's not even my birthday. Two gifts in one day, and both of them are children's stories. The first one is this. Oh, oh I feel like this is a East, I feel like this is a sanctuary miracle, Bill McPherson. And you'll understand why. Now I need somebody who's nearby to look closely. What is that? I don't know. That's too many legs. <laughs> what is that? I thought, I'll tell you, Bill McPherson, Bill we needs to wave, that's Bill. Bill, this was on his car on the way in. Now, it looks like what? It looks like a stick. It looks like a stick. Yes, it does. And when Bill brought it to me, I thought, Bill. <laughs> he brought me a stick and he put it in a mason jar and he said, I found this on my car. And I thought, well, it's just a stick. And you know, I'll tell you something. You want to see, Maria? Look at that. But what about that stick? That stick is a stick sled, and it, it looks like a stick because it, it's camouflaged. Great answer. She said, it's a stick bug, which is exactly the name I gave it, but it's actually called a walking stick, I found out. And she said it's camouflaged so that nobody eats it. None of the birds or anything eat it. You want to see this because it's so cool. Get to really look. Do you see it? And, and I'll tell you guys a secret. Allison and I were downstairs and she said it might be a walking stick bug, but it's dead. And she took the lid off in my office, which made me a little nervous, and she poked it with a pencil. Nothing happened. It was absolutely still. And I said, well, I'm still going to bring it up here. And now, just to see all of you guys, it is moving around. So today we're going to celebrate a baptism. And in a minute, what do we usually do with a baptism? What usually goes inside this bowl? What usually goes in there? Water, yeah, water usually goes in there, right? It looks like normal water, and it sort of is normal water. But God tells us, the Bible tells us, that when we're baptized in this moment, just in this moment, when a baby or an adult is baptized, it is living water. It is a reminder that we worship a God who is alive and present in the world. So I think I'm going to ask Braden to hold the walking stick. And when, at, when you go down for Sunday school, I think you're going to want to like, put that somewhere so people can watch it. Don't shake him up. He's had quite an adventure already today. So that water in that moment, which is just a moment or two, we're going to have a new baby, almost new, she's not yet a year, Evelyn Rose is her name, and she's getting welcomed into this family. That water is a living water, a reminder that she is now a part of this family. Do you want to see my second gift? My second gift was from my friend Ellie, and it came in a box, and I got it right before church, and his name is? I have to give him a name? Now this is going to take, he's a fuggle. That's what I found out. He's a fuggle. And so I think we're going to think a while, because I think he is our church fuggle. So he is going to be around the sanctuary all year in different places. And when you come to church, you have to see where he's got to. 
And he came with what, Ellie? A certificate. A certificate, and it is an adoption certificate. So all of us, we have welcomed this little fellow into our family, right? Just the way we are going to be welcoming Evelyn Rose as a church member and a part of our family. Ellie. I don't have the same clothes on next time. You're gonna, she has one like this at home, and she's going to bring it next time, and then we'll all be confused. <laughs> Which one's whose? So we're going to put our fuggle here and think on his name as we watch baby Evelyn get welcomed into our church family. So I'd like to invite Patrick and Jessica and their children to come forward. You can just stand right there. We come to this sanctuary to welcome Evelyn Rose Carroll into the church and to celebrate the sacrament of baptism. What does the church believe about baptism? We believe that in baptism, we are acknowledging God is active in our lives and in our relationships. We are remembering that we all come from God and our purpose is linked to our relationship with God. The waters of baptism are a sign and a seal not to God, but to us. They remind us that Christ lived and died to wash away our sin. They remind us that all of us, no matter what our age, we can have new beginnings and fresh starts. The waters of baptism symbolize God's welcome into this community, the church. Baptism marks us for who we are. We are beloved children of God. And baptism invites us to live out that very high calling. The great reformer Martin Luther noted that baptism uses the most ordinary and everyday of elements, water. He said, when we take a cold drink of water on a hot summer's afternoon, when we splash water on our face at the end of a long day, when we pour water into our kettles or to wash our dishes, we are called over and over again to remember our baptism, to remember we are all beloved children of God. I invite Bob Holt, the clerk of session, to come forward. Bob, who comes to be baptized today? On behalf of the session, I present Rose Evelyn Carroll, daughter of Patrick and Jessica Carroll. Thank you. Patrick and Jessica, do you believe that God is the creator of our world? Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as the light of, of the world and of your, as your Savior? And do you recognize the Holy Spirit as active in our world and a force in your lives. And will you provide for your daughter a Christian home of love and trust? <laughs> Somebody else is adding a bit in there. <laughs> will you set before her the example of a Christian life and will you pray that Evelyn will learn the way of Christ? And will you encourage her to grow within the fellowship of the Christian church? so that she may come to faith in Christ. All of us, we gather as the family of God in this place today to surround Patrick and Jessica and their children with God's love and God's acceptance. And so I ask all of you who are present, do you welcome this child joyfully and reverently into the family of God? Will you show her God's kind of love and help her grow in grace? Will you encourage her and pray for her and help her to see herself and those around her as made in the image of God? And now, who's pouring the water? Isaac is. Isaac, come on up. You're old enough. You can hold, you hold them both. You can do this. Um. 
We don't dunk, but, <laughs> but that's okay. We, you get to choose how much you want to put in there. That's good. Thank you, Isaac. Excellent. Let's join together in prayer. Living God, the water in the font is a symbol of life and a sign of blessing. So we pray that you will touch Evelyn now as she comes to be baptized in your name. Bless this holy time. Bless the water that reminds us that we are children of God. Bless us all as we share in this sacrament. Amen. Evelyn Rose, for you, Jesus Christ has come, has lived and suffered. For you, he has endured the agony of Gethsemane and the darkness of Calvary. For you, he has uttered the cry, it is accomplished. For you, he has triumphed over death. For you, he prays at God's right hand, all for you, Evelyn Rose, whether you fully understand it or not. In baptism, the words of the apostle are fulfilled. We love because God first loved us. Evelyn Rose, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord truly bless you and give you peace. Now, always my favorite part, I get to show this beautiful baby, the newest member of God's family to all of you, and our choir will be singing the ironic blessing. Isn't she lovely? So I'm going to give beautiful Evelyn back to her dad. We started a tradition here at Knox that uh, when a child is baptized, we are reminded that we send, are sending that child out to grow in the light of Christ and to share the light of Christ when she's old enough to go to school and with her friends and then uh, into the world uh, when she's an adult. So Jaden is going to light the candle. And on behalf of the church, there's been a tradition, a long-standing tradition, to present families with a pink flower for a baby girl and a blue flower for a baby boy. And so, Isaac, maybe you could hold that for us, could you? Thank you. And Bob, I'd like to invite you to make the presentation of the baptismal certificate and uh, the book on behalf of the WMS. Let's sing together the first verse of that baptismal hymn as our children go out to Sunday school.
Well, as most of you know, I, I grew up in the country outside of Dundas in, here in Ontario. And I, I have, as a child, I have fond memories of growing up in our rural community. I have memories of barn dances as a child and skating parties on the pond that was just over the farmer's hill uh, where we lived. My brother and sister and I, we had a host of people that we called aunt and uncle, but they were no blood relation to any of us. They were really just neighbors or friends of the family, but they were all longtime residents of that community. And every fall, almost all of the people who lived along our road, we all worked at Rockton World's Fair, which still goes on today, on thanks, or to this day, on, held every year on Thanksgiving weekend. Every Christmas Eve, that same group of people, we gathered for worship at a local United Church in Cope Town, another little dot on the map. And then we all shuffled off to our home or someone else's home. We'd wait together for Santa to arrive. The adults would sip eggnog and nibble on fruitcake and shortbread. And growing up in that community, we all attended each other's birthday parties. I know some of you have grown up in a similar kind of community. We baked cakes and prepared casseroles for one another when there was a, a death in the family. And whenever there was a wedding in that community, whenever there was a wedding, there was always held a community shower. And these community showers, they almost always included a mock wedding, which would be unheard of, I think, of today, but the bride and groom were sort of mocked by doing a fake wedding, and usually the pretend bride was the largest farmer in the community, that they dolled up with a veil and a white dress, and everyone laughed, and the gifts at those community showers were always things like pickled beets, or homemade placemats. And when Tom and I got married, along with the jars of pickled beets and the homemade placemats, we were presented with a photo album. And it was one of those photo albums, you might remember them or have discovered them in your parents' basement. You know, the kind where you peeled off that cellophane and it, it made that sticky sound? <laughs> it was one of those. And we were given this photo album, and it was filled with handwritten marriage advice from the longtime members of this rural community where I grew up. And I still have it. It's tucked away in our basement in a cardboard box. It's all brittle now, each of those cellophone pages and yellow around the edges. But the marriage advice included gems like this. In every disagreement, remember, there is no winner and no loser. It's good marriage advice. Or this one, the two most important words in any marriage are thank you. And then there's one scrawled by, probably by the old farmer <laughs> dressed up as the bride. He wrote in capital letters, a happy wife. A happy life. <laughs> He'd been married a long time. Well, that, that photo album, it was really just a collection, right? It was just a collection of wisdom from people who had been there. People who were wishing us well and attempting to give us a few tips as we embarked on that sometimes tumultuous journey called marriage. Well, our scripture lesson today, it's coming from the book of James. And this letter is its own kind of advice book. It's not written for newlyweds or young couples. But it is written for those who are embarking on an equally tumultuous journey. The first listeners of today's scripture we're not brand new Christians. The spark of first belief had faded for all of them. 
The people who first heard the scripture we're going to hear today, they were people a lot like many of us. They were in it for the long haul. They were people who knew the stories of Jesus, who had experienced God in a variety of ways, and now they were trying, trying hard to live out their faith. They were trying to be Christians in their church and in their family and in their neighborhood and in their world. Now, the book of James, unlike many of the other letters in the New Testament, was not written by the Apostle Paul. And most scholars believe it wasn't written to one particular community about one particular problem. Most scholars believe it's sort of like that cellophane photo album. It's wisdom literature. It's a collection of tips and advice penned by one person to help people live lives that reflected their faith. So let's listen together to James chapter 3. And I'm, I'm reading today from a different translation. It's called The Message. And it's a paraphrase of scripture produced by Eugene Peterson. Let's listen for the word of God. None of us is perfectly qualified we get it wrong nearly every time we open our mouths. If you could find someone whose speech was perfectly true, you'd have a perfect person in perfect control of life. A bit in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse. A small rudder on a large ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets a course in the face of the strongest winds. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or a wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. My friends, this can't go on. A spirit doesn't gush fresh water one day and brackish the next, does it? Apple trees don't bear strawberries, do they? Raspberry bushes don't bear apples, do they? You're not going to dip into a polluted mud hole and get a cup of clear, cool water, are you? We thank God for this reading from his word. Let's join together in prayer. Almighty God, may this message be in the name of the Father and for the sake of the Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I was listening to CBC Radio this week on my way into work one morning, uh, and the business report came on, and the, the announcer, as many announcers have been doing, was reflecting on China and U.S. relations. And he talked about how even a few words from President Trump about China was affecting the entire stock market. Better off without them, Trump had tweeted, and the stock market slumped within hours. We're having a conversation, he tweeted, and the numbers spiked back up. I would submit to you that the words that we say in our own lives might not have that kind of effect, but they have the same kind of relationship. How many of us have grumbled, I'm having a bad day, after someone was short-tempered with us? Or how many of us have found ourselves walking just a little bit taller, our shoulders back a little bit more after a pretty simple compliment from someone? 
A, a clergy friend of mine, he said once to me that all of the most critical moments in his life, all of the most critical moments in his life were linked to words. Words like, I love you, changed his life. Words like, will you marry me? Or, it's a boy. Or, I'm sorry, there was nothing more we could do. Just words. But those words had power and weight. Our, our scripture lesson today, it is not heady. It is not an intellectual piece of writing. It tells us something pretty basic, I think. It's something we already know, but we often ignore. In life and in the life of faith, the author of the letter of James says, words matter. Our words matter. Words change the world. They change us. They change the lives of the people around us. So James, he says, choose your words with care as people of faith. Remember what you say in a moment of great sadness or great joy or frustration or fatigue those words could direct the course of someone else's life, sort of like the rudder of a ship. Those few words could destroy something that God has been taking years to create. Our words are like a carelessly dropped cigarette in a forest. What you and I say as people of faith in a moment of sadness or great joy or frustration or fatigue, those words matter. I, I read an article years ago. It was entitled, What Saved Superman's Life? It's a catchy title. You, you would think you know, just reading the title that it was about kryptonite blocking chemicals being discovered or some sci-fi intergalactic potion or secret power written into a comic book character. But this article, What Saved Superman's Life, it was not science fiction. True story, it told the very true story and heartbreaking story of Christopher Reeve. You might remember he was the actor who played Superman in the 1978 movie of the same name. Reeve was a, a shoe-in for that part. He was six foot four. He had one of those strong jaws and rippling muscles. And for my generation, anyway, Christopher Reeve was sort of Superman. What some of you might recall is that Reeve, an avid equestrian, fell off his horse during an equestrian event when he was in his early 40s after those movies had been made. And overnight, Superman became a quadriplegic. And in this article, What Saved Superman's Life, Reeve talks about the accident. He talks about waking up in the hospital. He talks about living life without the use of arms or legs when you used to be Superman. When he is quoted in this article, he, he says, when they told me what my condition was after the accident, that I would be paralyzed from the neck down, I felt that I was no longer a human being. I wept. Then he said his wife, Dana, came into the room. He said she knelt down to the level of his bed and they made eye contact. And Reeve recalled saying to her, whispering to her, Maybe this isn't worth it. 
Maybe I should just check out. And in the article, he says he remembered his wife was crying. And she said, but you're still you. And I love you. And Superman, Christopher Reeve, said, it was those words, those eight simple words that saved my life. Sometimes I think it's easy for us to think that this thing called faith is something we hold in our heart or it's something we believe in our head. But the writer of James, he tells us that this thing called faith is something we speak. It sounds like I'm sorry. It sounds like I love you anyway. It sounds like I am praying for you. It sounds like you are beautiful. And I would submit to you that sometimes faith even sounds like silence. The kind of comfortable silence that falls between friends. The kind of silence that is better than a shouted word or a searing insult. The kind of silence that falls in a hospital room when there is nothing really else to say but to be there. Language is a secret superpower that God has planted in all of us. And he's given us those gifts so that the sacred gifts of hope and peace and joy and love can be made real, can be given a voice in our world. You and I, we have been given a secret superpower that has the ability to change, maybe not the stock market, but the kind of day someone has. We have been given a secret superpower that has the ability to help people see themselves differently or to see God differently. So on this Grandparents Sunday, when we're really just thinking about relationships between children and adults, between friends and neighbors, brothers and sisters in Christ, grandparents and grandchildren, on this Baptism Sunday, when we think about the words of baptism, you are a beloved child of God. Today, God is challenging all of us to take control of our words this week, to recognize the power in them, to think before we speak, Because the words we say, they are God's secret superpower. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, help us in the week ahead to think carefully about how we speak to our family members, to our neighbors, to our fellow church members and out in the world. Help us to be people who speak words of hope and joy. Help us to be still and know what words you long for us to say. Help us to be your voice to a broken world, for we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, I'm not sure if I've told you this one before, but sometimes I... It's a good one, so I have to repeat it. Henry was in his workshop at home listening to the radio as he puttered around doing various jobs. The program was interrupted by a serious-sounding announcement on the radio. There was someone driving in the wrong 
direction down the main highway close to the town. So Henry was worried about his wife, Glenda. She was returning from the mall. And he picked up the phone. He knew she didn't like using that cell phone. He'd got it for her for this exact reason. He picked up his phone. He dialed her cell number. And unbelievably, Glenda answered. Honey, he said, I want you to be careful driving home. I just heard on the news there is some idiot driving the wrong way down the highway. And Glenda, Glenda replied quickly, Henry, I know. It's not just one car. There's hundreds of them. <laughs> the Lord loves a cheerful giver. The offering will be received.
Let us pray. Living God, we bring these gifts and pray that you will bless them. May they be used with wisdom and with faith so that your kingdom will come to earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Let's continue our worship as we join together in prayer. Let us pray. God of all generations, we give you thanks that you are not confined to one generation or to one culture or to one people. And so, O oh God, in faith, we lift our hearts to you in prayer. We hold up to you those who are in hospital today. We pray for those who are grieving this morning. Loving God, we hold up to you those who this past week have lost their homes or family members around our world due to terrible storms or unforeseen tragedies. Gracious God, amidst all of that brokenness and despair, we pray for your presence and for your strength. And living God, on this Sunday when we baptized a new baby, we thank you for the gift of children. We pray, O oh God, for those who are struggling to bear children even today. We pray for children who live in places where there is great poverty or great violence. And we ask, O oh God, that you might empower our church so that we might be a beacon of light in this community and in your world showing others the love of God. For we pray in the great name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 767 in the Book of Praise, Lord, Speak to Me.
Now let us go in peace and may the grace of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain and abide with each of you and all whom you love this day and forevermore. Thank mm-hmm. you.